Okay, continuing our read of volume six. This one is called How Spoilers Bleed. Locke raised his eyes to the trees. The wind was moving in them, and the commotion of their laden branches sounded like the river of full spate, one impersonation of many. When he had first come to the jungle, he had been awed by the sheer multiplicity of beast and blossom, the relentless parade of life here. But he had learned better. This burgeoning diversity was a sham, the jungle pretending itself an artless garden. It was not. Where the untutored trespasser saw only a brilliant show of natural splendors, Locke now recognized a subtle conspiracy at work in which each thing mirrored some other thing. The trees, the river, a blossom, a bird. In a moth swing, a monkey's eye, or on a lizard's back, sunlight on stones. Round and round in a dizzying circle of impersonations, a hall of mirrors which confounded the senses and would, given time, not rot reason altogether. See us now, he thought drunkenly as they stood around Cherrick's grave. Look at how we play the game, too. We're living, but we impersonate the dead better than the dead themselves. The corpse had been one scab by the time they'd hoisted it into a sack and carried it outside to this miserable plot behind Tettleman's house to bury. There were half a dozen other graves here, all Europeans to judge by the names, crudely burned to the wooden crosses, killed by snakes or heat or longing. Tettleman attempted to say a brief prayer in Spanish, but the roar of the trees and the din of birds making their way home to their roosts before night came down all but drowned him out. He gave up eventually, and they made their way back into the cooler interior of the house where Stump was sitting, drinking brandy and staring inanely at the darkening stain on the floorboards. Outside, two of Tettleman's tamed Indians were shoveling the rank jungle earth on top of Cherrick's sack, eager to be done with the work and away before nightfall. Locke watched from the window. Grave diggers didn't talk as they labored, but filled the shallow grave up and flattened the earth as best they could with the leather tough soles of their feet. As they did so, the stamping of the ground took a rhythm. It occurred to Locke that the men were probably the worst for bad whiskey. He knew few Indians who didn't drink like fishes. Now staggering a little, they began to dance on Cherrick's grave. Locke? Locke woke. In the darkness, a cigarette glowed. As the smoker drew on it and the tip burned more intensely, Stump's wasted features swam out of the night. Locke, are you awake? What do you want? I can't sleep, the mask replied. I've been thinking. The supply plane comes in from Santarum the day after tomorrow. We could be back there in a few hours, out of all this. Sure. I mean permanently, Stump said. Away. Permanently? Stump lit another cigarette from the embers of his last before saying, I don't believe in curses. Don't think I do. Who said anything about curses? You saw Cherrick's body. What happened to him? There's a disease, said Locke. What's it called? When the blood doesn't set properly? Hemophilia, Stump replied. He didn't have hemophilia, and we both know it. I've seen him scratched and cut dozens of times. He mended like you or I. Locke snatched at a mosquito that had alighted on his chest and scrounged out between thumb and forefinger. All right, then what killed him? You saw the wounds better than I did, but it seemed to me his skin just broke open as soon as he was touched. Locke nodded. That's the way it looked. Maybe it's something he caught off the Indians. Locke took the point. I didn't touch any of them, he said. Neither did I, but he did, remember? Locke remembered. Scenes like that weren't easy to forget, try as he might. Christ, he said, his voice hushed. What a fucking situation. I'm going back to Santrum. I don't want them coming looking for me. They're not going to. How do you know? We screwed up back there. We could have bribed them. We got off the land some we got them off the land some other way. I doubt it. You heard what Tettleman said, ancestral territories. You can have my share of the land, Stump said. I want no part of it. You mean it then? You're getting out? I feel dirty. We're spoilers, Locke. It's your funeral. I mean it. And I'm not like you. Never really had the stomach for this kind of thing. Will you buy my third off me? Depends on your price. Whatever you want to give. It's yours. Confessional over, Stump returned to his bed and lay down in the darkness to finish off his cigarette. It would soon be light, another jungle dawn, a precious interval all too short before the world began to sweat. How he hated the place. At least he hadn't touched any of the Indians, hadn't even been within breathing distance of them. Whatever infection they'd passed on to Cherrick, he should surely not be tainted. In less than 48 hours, he would be away to Santrum, and then on to some city, any city where the tribe could never follow. He had already done his penance, hadn't he? 
paid for his greed and his arrogance with the rot in his abdomen and the terrors he knew would never quite shake off again. Let that be punishment enough, he prayed and slipped before the monkeys began to call the day into a spoiler's sleep. A gem-backed beetle, trapped beneath Stump's mosquito net, hummed around in dim diminishing circles, looking for some way out. He could find none. Eventually, exhausted by the search, it hovered over the sleeping man and landed on his forehead. There it wandered, drinking at the pores. Beneath its unperceptible tread, Stump's skin opened and broke onto a trail of tiny wounds. They had come into the Indian hamlet at noon, the sun a basilisk sigh. At first, they had thought the place deserted. Locke and Cherick had advanced into the compound, leaving the dysentery-ridden stump from the jeep out of the worst of the heat. It was Cherick who first noted the child, a pot-bellied boy, perhaps four or five, his face painted with thick bands of the scarlet vegetable dye Yuraku, had slipped out of his hiding place and come to peer at the passengers, fearless in his curiosity. Cherick stood still, Locke did the same. One by one from the huts and from the shelter of the trees around the compound, the tribe appeared and stared like the boy in, at the newcomers. If there was a flicker of feeling in their broad, flat-nosed faces, flat faces, Locke could not read it. The people, he thought of every Indian as part of one wretched tribe, were impossible to decipher. Deceit was their only skill. What are you doing here, he said. The sun was baking the back of his neck. This is our land. The boy still looked up at him. His almond eyes refused to fear. They don't understand you, Cherick said. Get the crowd out here. Let him explain it to them. He can't move. Get him out here, Locke said. I don't care if he's shat his pants. Cherick backed away down the track, leaving Locke standing in the ring of huts. He looked from doorway to doorway, from tree to tree, trying to estimate the numbers. There were at most three dozen Indians, two-thirds of them women and children, descendants of the great peoples that had once roamed the Amazon basin in their tens of thousands. Now those tribes were all but decimated. The forest in which they had prospered for generations was being leveled and burned. Eight-lane highways were speeding through their hunting grounds. All they held sacred, the wilderness and their place in its system, was being trampled and trespassed. They were exiles in their own land, but they still declined to, play, to pay homage to their new masters, despite the rifles they brought. Only death would convince them of defeat, Locke mused. Cherry found stump drunk. Slumped in the front seat of the jeep, his pasty features were more wretched than ever. Locke wants you, he said, shaking the German out of his doze. The village is still occupied. You'll have to speak to them. Stumped groaned. I can't move, he said. I'm dying. Locke wants you dead or alive, Sherrick said. The fear of Locke, which went unspoken, was perhaps one of the two things they had in common, that and greed. I feel awful, Stump said. If I don't bring you, he'll only come himself, Sherrick pointed out. This was indisputable. Stump threw off the other man a despairing glance, then nodded his jowly head. All right, he said. Help me. Cherrick had no wish to lay a hand on Stump. The man stank of his sickness. He seemed to be oozing the contents of his gut through the pores. His skin had the luster of rank meat. He took the ostrich hand nevertheless. Without aid, Stump would never make the hundred yards to Jeep, from Jeep to compound. A headlock was shouting. Get moving, said Cherrick, pulling Stump down from the front seat toward the bawling voice. Let's get it over and done with. When the two men returned into the circle of huts, the scene had scarcely changed. Locke glanced around at Stump. We've got trespassers, he said. So I see, Stump returned wearily. Tell them to get the fuck off our land, Locke said. Tell them this is our territory. We bought it without sitting tenants. Stump nodded, not meeting Locke's rabid eyes. Sometimes he hated the man almost as much as he hated himself. Go on, Locke said, and gestured for Jarek to relinquish his support of Stump. This he did. The German mumbled, stumbled forward, head bowed. He took several seconds to work out his patter, then raised his head and spoke a few wilting words in bad Portuguese. The pronouncement was met with the same blank looks as Locke's performance. Stumped tried again, rearranging his inadequate vocabulary to try and awake a flicker of understanding amongst these savages. The boy who had been so entertained by Locke's cavortings now stood staring at this third demon, his face wiped with smiles. This one was nowhere near as comical as the first. He was sick and haggard. He smelt of death. The boy held his nose to keep from inhaling the badness off the man. Stump peered through greasy eyes at his audience. If they did understand and were faking their blank incomprehension, it was a flawless performance. His limited skills defeated, he turned giddily to Locke. They don't understand me, he said. Tell them again. I don't think they speak Portuguese. Tell them anyway. Cherrick cocked his rifle. We don't have time to talk with them, he said under his breath. They're on our land. We're within our rights. No, said Locke, there's no need for shooting, not if we can persuade them to go peacefully. They don't understand plain common sense, Cherrick said. Look at them, they're animals, living in filth. 
Stump had begun to try and communicate again, this time accompanying his hesitant words with a pitiful mind. Tell them we've got work to do here, Locke prompted him. I'm trying my best, Stump replied testily. We've got papers. I don't think they'd be much impressed, Stump returned with a cautious sarcasm that was lost on the other man. Just tell them to move on, find some other piece of land to squat on. Watching Stump put these sentiments into word and sign language, Locke was already running through the alternative options available. Either the Indians or the Texacame or the Aqual or whatever damn family it was accepted their demands and moved on or else they would have to enforce the edict. As Cherik had said, they were within their rights. They had papers from the development authorities. They had maps marking the division between one territory and the next. They had every sanction from signature to bullet. He had no active desire to shed blood. The world was still too full of bleeding heart liberals and doe-eyed sentimentalists to make genocide the most convenient solution. But the gun had been used before and would be used again until every unwashed Indian had put their pair of trousers and had given up eating monkeys. Indeed, the din of liberals notwithstanding, the gun had its appeal. It was swift and absolute. Once it had its short, sharp say, there was no danger of further debate, no chance that in 10 years' time some mercenary Indian who'd found a copy of Marx in the gutter would come back claiming his tribal lands, oil, minerals, and all. Once gone, they were gone forever. At the thought of these scarlet-faced savages laid low, Locke felt his trigger finger itch, physically itch. Stump had finished his encore. It met with no response. Now he groaned and turned to Locke. I'm going to be sick, he said. His face was bright white. The glamour of his skin made his small teeth look dingy. Be my guest, Locke replied. Please, I have to lie down. I don't want them watching me. Locke shook his head. You don't have, you, you don't move till they listen. If we don't get any joy from them, you're going to see something to be sick about. Locke toyed with the stock of his rifle as he spoke, running a broken thumbnail along the nicks in it. There were perhaps a dozen, one, each one a human grave. The jungle concealed murder so easily, it almost seemed, in its cryptic fashion, to condone the crime. Stumpf turned away from Locke and scanned the mute assembly. There were so many Indians here, he thought, and though he carried a pistol, he was an inept marksman. Suppose they rushed Locke, Cherik, and himself. He would not survive. And yet, looking at the Indians, he would see no sign of aggression amongst them. Once they had been warriors, now, like beaten children, sullen and willfully stupid. There was some trace of beauty in one or two of the younger women. Their skins, though grimy, were fine, their eyes black. Had he felt more healthy, he might have been aroused by their nakedness, tempted to press his hands upon their shiny bodies. As it was, their feigned incomprehension merely, merely irritated him. They seemed, in their silence, like another species, and ain't mysterious and unfathomable as mules or birds. Hadn't somebody in Uxituba told him that many of these people didn't even give their children proper names? that each was like a limb of the tribe anonymous and therefore unfixable. He could believe that now, meeting the same dark stare in each pair of eyes, could believe that what they faced here was not three dozen individuals, but a fluid system of hatred made flesh. It made him shudder to think of it. Now for the first time since their appearance, one of the assembly moved. He was an ancient, fully 30 years older than most of the tribe. He, like the rest, was all but naked. The sacking flesh of his limbs and breast resembled tanned hide. His step, though the paralyzed suggested blindness, was perfectly confident. Once standing in front of the interlopers, he opened his mouth. There were no teeth set in his rotted gums and spoke. What emerged from his scraggy throat was not a language made of words, but only of sound, a potpourri of jungle noises. There was no discernible pattern to the outpouring. It was simply a display, awesome in its way of impersonations. The man could murmur like a jaguar, screech like a parrot, he could find in his throat the splash of rain on orchids, the howl of monkeys. The sounds made stump scorch rise. The jungle had diseased him, dehydrated him, and left him wrung out. Now this roommate man, stick man, was vomiting the whole odious place up at him. The raw heat in the circle of huts made stump's head beat, and he was sure, as he stood listening to the sage's din, that the old man was measuring the rhythm of this nonsense to the thud of his temples and wrists. What's he saying? Locke demanded. What did it sound like? Stumpf replied, irritated by Locke's idiot questions. It's all noises. The fucker's cursing us, Cherik said. Stumpf looked around at the third man. Cherik's eyes were starting from his head. It's a curse, he said to Stump. Locke laughed, unmoved by Cherik's apprehension. He pushed Stumpf out of the way so as to face the old man, whose song speech was now lowered to pitch. It was almost lilting. He was singing Twilight, Stumpf thought, that brief ambiguity between the fierce day and the suffocating night. Yes, that was it. He could hear the song and the purr and the coo of a drowsy kingdom. It was so persuasive, he wanted to lie down on the spot where he stood and slept. Locke broke the spell. What are you saying? He spat in the tribesman's mazy face. 
talk sense. But the night noise is only whispered on an unbroken stream. This is our village, another voice now broke in. The man spoke as if translating the elder's words. Locke snapped round to locate the speaker. He was thin youth whose skin might have once been golden. Our village, our land. You speak English, Locke said. Some, the youth replied. Why didn't you answer me earlier? Locke demanded, his fury exacerbated by the disinterest on the Indian's face. Not my place to speak, the man replied. He is the elder. The chief, you mean. The chief is dead. All his family is dead. This is the wisest of us. Then you tell him. No need to tell him, the young man broke in. He understands you. He speaks English too? No, the other replied. But he understands you. You are transparent. Locke half grasped that the youth was implying an insult here, but wasn't quite certain. He gave Stumpf a puzzled look. The German shook his head. Locke returned his attention to the youth. Tell him anyway, he said. Tell all of them. This is our land. We bought it. The tribe has always lived here, the reply came. Not any longer, Cherik said. We've got papers, Stumpf said mildly, still hoping that the confrontation might end peacefully. From the government. We were here before the government, the tribesman replied. The old man had stopped talking in the forest. Perhaps Stumpf thought he was coming to the beginning of another day and stopped. He was turning away now, indifferent to the presence of those unwelcome guests. Call him back, Locke demanded, stabbing his rifle towards the young tribesman. The gesture was un unambiguous. Make him tell the rest of them they've got to go. The young man seemed unimpressed by the threat of Locke's rifle, however, and clearly unwilling to give orders to his elder, whatever the imperative. He simply watched the old man walk back towards the hut from which he had merged. Around the compound, others were also turning away. The old man's withdrawal apparently signaled that the show was over. No, said Cherik, you are not listening. The color in his cheeks had risen a tone, his voice an octave. He pushed forward, rifle raised. You fucking scum. Despite his hysteria, he was rapidly losing his audience. The old man had reached the doorway of his hut and now bent his back and disappeared into its recesses. The few members of the tribe who were still showing some interest in proceedings were viewing the Europeans with a hint of pity for their lunacy. It only enraged Cherik further. Listen to me, he shrieked, sweat flicking off his brow as he jerked his head to one retreating figure and then another. Listen, you bastards. Easy, said Stumpf. The appeal triggered Cherik. Without warning, he raised his rifle to his shoulder, aimed at the open door of the hut into which the old man had vanished and fired. Birds rose from the crowns of adjacent trees dog took to their heels. From within the hut came a tiny shriek, not like the old man's voice at all. As it sounded, Stump fell to his knees, hugging his belly, his gut and spasm. Face to the ground, he did not see the diminutive figure emerge from the hut and totter into the sunlight. Even when he did look up and saw how the child with the scarlet face clutched his belly, he hoped his eyes lied but they did not. It was blood that came from between the child's tiny fingers and death that had stricken his face. He fell forward on the impacted earth of the hut's threshold, twitched and died. Somewhere amongst the huts, a woman began to sob quietly. For a moment, the world spun in a pinhead that balanced exquisitely between silence and a cry that must break it between a truce held and the upcoming atrocity. You stupid bastard. Locke murmured to Cherith. Under his condemnation, his voice trembled. Back off, he said. Get up, Stumpf. We're not waiting. Get up and come now, or don't come at all. Stumpf was still looking at the body of the child. Suppressing his moans, he got to his feet. Help me, he said. Locke lent him an arm. Cover us, he said to Cherith. The man nodded, deathly pale. Some of the tribe had returned their gaze, had turned their gaze on the Europeans' retreat, their expressions despite this tragedy as inscrutable as ever. Only the sobbing woman, presumably the dead child's mother, woke between the silent figures, keening her grief. Cherik's rifle shook as he kept the bridgehead. He'd done the mathematics. If it came to a head-on collision, they had little chance of survival. But even now, with the enemy making a getaway, there was no sign of movement amongst the Indians. Just the accusing facts, the dead boy, the warm rifle. Cherik chanced to look over his shoulder. Block and Stump were already within 20 yards of the jeep, and there was still no move from the savages. Then as he looked back towards the compound, it seemed as though the tribe breathed together one solid breath and hearing that sound, Cherik felt death wedge itself like a fishbone in his throat, too deep to be plucked out by his fingers, too big to be shot. It was just waiting there, lodged in his anatomy beyond argument or appeal. He was distracted from its presence by a movement at the door of the hut. Quite ready to make the same mistake again, he took firmer hold of the rifle. The old man had reappeared at the door. He stepped over the corpse of the boy, which was lying where it had toppled. Again, Cherik glanced behind him. Surely they were at the jeep, but Stump had stumbled. Locke was even now dragging him to his feet. 
Cherrick, seeing the old man advancing towards him, took one cautious step backwards, followed by another. But the old man was fearless. He walked swiftly across the compound, coming to and stand so close to Cherrick, his body as vulnerable as ever, that the rifle of the barrel prodded his shrunken belly. There was blood on both his hands, fresh enough to run down the man's arms where he displayed the palms for Cherrick's benefit. Had he touched the boy, Cherrick wondered, as he stepped out of the hut? If so, it had been an astonishing sleight of hand, for Cherrick had seen nothing. Trick or no trick, the significance of the display was perfectly apparent. He was being accused of murder. Cherrick wasn't about to be cowed, however. He stared back at the old man, matching defiance with defiance. But the old bastard did nothing except show his bloody palms, his eyes full of tears. Cherrick could feel his anger growing again. He poked the man's flesh with his finger. You don't frighten me, he said. You understand? I'm not a fool. As he spoke, he seemed to see a shifting in the old man's features. It was a trick of the sun, of course, or a bird shadow, but there was, beneath the corruption of age, a hint of the child now dead at the hut door, the tiny mouse even seemed to smile. Then, as subtly as it appeared, the illusion faded again. Cherrick withdrew his hand from the old man's chest, narrowing his eyes against further mirages. He then re renewed his retreat. He had taken three steps only when something broke cover to his left. He swung round, raised his rifle, and fired. A piebald pig, one of several that had been grazing around the huts, was checked in its flight by the bullet, then struck in the neck. It seemed to trip over itself and collapsed headlong into the dust. Cherrick swung his rifle back towards the old man, but he hadn't moved except to open his mouth. His palate was making the sound of the dying pig, a choking squeal, pitiful and ridiculous, which followed Cherrick back up the path to the keep. Block had the engine running. Get in, he said. Cherrick needed no encouragement and flung himself into the front seat. The interior of the vehicle was filthy hot and stank of stumps, bodily functions, but it was near safety as they had been in the past hour. It was a pig, he said. I shot a pig. I saw, said Locke, that old bastard. He didn't finish. He was looking down at the two fingers from which he had prodded the elder. I touched him, he muttered, perplexed by what he saw. The fingertips were bloodied, though the flesh he had laid his fingers upon had been clean. Locke ignored Cherrick's confusion and backed the jeep up to turn it around, then drove away from the hamlet down a track that seemed to have become choked with foliage in the hours since they'd come up it. There was no discernible pursuit. The tiny trading post to the south of Averia was scant of civilization, but it sufficed. There were white faces here and clean water. Stump, whose condition had deteriorated on the return journey, was treated by Dancy, an Englishman who had the manner of a disenfranchised earl and a face like hammered steak. He claimed to have been a doctor once upon a sober time, and though he had no evidence of his qualifications, nobody contested his right to deal with Stumpf. The German was delirious and on occasion violent, but Dancy, his small hands heavy with gold rings, seemed to take a positive delight in nursing his thrashing patient. While Stumpf raved beneath his mosquito net, net Locke and Cherrick sat in the lamp-lit gloom and drank, then told the story of their encounter with the tribe. It was Tettleman, the owner of the trading post stores, who had most to say when the report was finished. He knew the Indians well. I've been here years, he said, feeding nuts to the mangy monkey that scampered at his lap. I know the way these people think. They may act as though, as though they're stupid, cowards even. Take it from me, them either. No? I'm so sorry. It's okay. I just was fighting with this thing for 20 million years. So yeah. I'm so sorry. I mean, uh, it's okay. I love no, you. it's fine. I love you. The tiny trading post to the south of Bavaria was scant in civilization, but it sufficed. There were white faces here and clean water. Stump, whose condition had deteriorated on the return journey, was treated by Dancy, an Englishman who had the manner of a disenfranchised earl and a face like hammered steak. He claimed to have been a doctor once upon a sober time, and though he had no evidence of his qualifications, nobody contested his right to deal with Stump. The German was delirious and on occasion violent, but Dancy, his small hands heavy with gold rings, seemed to take a positive delight in nursing his thrashing patient. While Stump raved beneath his mosquito net, Locke and Cherrick sat in the lamp-lit gloom and drank, then told the story of their encounter with the tribe. It was Tettleman, the owner of the Trading Post stores, who had most say when the report was finished. He knew the Indians well. I've been here years, he said, beating nuts to the mangy monkey that scampered on his lap. I know the way these people think. They may act as though they're stupid, cowards even. Take it from me, they're neither. Cherrick grunted. The quick silver monkey fixed him with vacant eyes. They didn't make a move on us, Cherrick said, even though they outnumbered us ten to one. If that isn't cowardice, what is it? Tattleman settled back in his creaking chair, throwing the animal off his lap. 
His face was rattled and used. Only his lips, constantly re from his glass, had any color. He looked, thought, locked, like an old whore. Thirty years ago, Tettleman said, this whole territory was their homeland. Nobody wanted it. They went where they liked, did what they liked. As far as we whites were concerned, the jungle was filthy and disease-infected. We wanted no part of it. And, of course, in some ways, we were right. It is filthy, filthy and disease-infected, but it's also got reserves now we want badly. Minerals, oil, maybe, power. We paid for that land, said Locke, his fingers jittery on the cracked rim of his glass. It's all we've got now. Tettleman sneered. Paid, he said. The monkey chattered at his feet, apparently as amused by this claim as his master. No, you just paid for a blind eye so you could take it by force. You paid for the right to fuck up the Indians in any way you could. That's what your dollars bought, Mr. Locke. The government of this country is counting off the months until every tribe in this subcontinent is wiped out by you or your luck. There's no use to play the outraged innocence. I've been here too long. Cherick spat on the dead, the bare floor. Tettleman's speech had heated his blood. So why'd you come here if you're so fucking clever? He asked the trader. Same reason as you, Tettleman replied plainly, staring off into the trees beyond the plot of land behind the store. Their silhouettes shook against the sky, wind or night birds. What reason's that? Cherick said, barely keeping his hostility in check. Read, Tettleman replied mildly, still watching the trees. Something scampered across the low wooden roof. The monkey at Tettleman's feet listened, head cocked. I thought I could make my fortune out here the same way you do. I gave myself two years, three at the most. That was the best part of two decades ago. He frowned. Whatever thoughts passed behind his eyes, they were bitter. The jungle eats you up and spits you out sooner or later. Not me, said Locke. Tettleman turned his eyes on the man. They were wet. Oh, yes, he said politely. Extinction's in the air, Mr. Locke. I can smell it. Then he turned back to looking at the window. Whatever was on the roof now had companions. They won't come here, will they, said Cherick. They won't follow us. The question, spoken almost in a whisper, begged for a reply in the negative. Try as he might, Cherick couldn't dislodge the sights of the previous day. It wasn't the boy's corpse that so haunted him, but he could soon learn to forget. But the elder, with his shifting sunlit face and the palms raised as to display some stigmata, he was not so forgettable. Don't fret, Tettleman said with a trace of condescension. Sometimes one or two of them will drift in here with a parrot to sell or a few pots, but I've never seen them come here in any numbers. They don't like it. This is civilization as far as they're concerned, and it intimidates them. Besides, they wouldn't harm my guests. They need me. Need you, said Locke. Who, who could need this wreck of a man? They use our medicines. Dancy supplies them and blankets once in a while. As I said, they're not so stupid. Next door, Stump began to howl. Dancy's consoling voice could be heard, attempting to talk down the panic. He was plainly failing. Your friend's gone bad, said Tellman. No friend, Cherick replied. It rots, Tettleman murmured half to himself. What does? The soul. The word was utterly out of place from Tettleman. Whiskey's glops lists. It's like fruit, you see, it rots. Somehow Stump's cries gave force to the observation. It was not the voice of a wholesome creature. There was putrescence in it. More to his direct his attention away from the German's din than out of any real interest, Cherick said, what do they give you for the medicines and blankets? Women? Possibility clearly entertained Tettleman. He laughed, his gold teeth, teeth gleaming. I've no use for women, he said. I've had the sip for too many years. He clicked his fingers and the monkey clambered back up his lap. The soul, he said, isn't the only thing that rots. Well, what do you get from them? Locke said, for your supplies. Artifacts, Tettleman replied. Bowls, jugs, mats. The Americans buy them off me and sell them again in Manhattan. Everybody wants something made by an extinct tribe these days. Memento Mori. Extinct, said Locke. The word had a seductive ring. It sounded like life to him. Oh, certainly, said Tettleman. They're as good as gone. If you don't wipe them out, they'll do it themselves. Suicide, Locke said. In their fashion, they just lose heart. I've seen it happen half a dozen times. The tribe loses its land and its appetite for life goes with it. They stop taking care of themselves. The women don't get pregnant anymore. The young men take to drink. The old men just starve themselves to death. In a year or two, it's like they never existed. Locke swallowed the rest of his drink, silently saluting the fatal wisdom of these people. They knew when to die, which was more than he could be said for some he'd met. The thought of their deaths, which absolved him of any last vestiges of guilt. What was the gun in his hand except an instrument of evolution? On the fourth day after their arrival at the post, Stump's fever abated, much to Dancy's disappointment. The worst of it's over, he announced, give two more days rest and you can get back to your labors. What are your plans, Tuttleman wanted to know. 
Locke was watching the rain from the veranda, sheets of water pouring from clouds so low they brushed the treetops. Then, just as suddenly as it arrived, the downpour was gone as though a tap had been turned off. Sun broke through, the jungle new wash was steaming, sprouting and thriving again. I don't know what we'll do, said Locke. Maybe get ourselves some help and go back in there. There are ways, Tettleman said. Tarek, sitting beside the door to give the benefit of what little breeze was available, picked up the glass that had scarcely been out of his hand in recent days and filled it up again. No more guns, he said. He hadn't touched his rifle since they'd arrived at the post. In fact, he kept from contact with anything but a bottle in his bed. His skin seemed to crawl and creep perpetually. No need for guns, Tettleman murmured. The statement hung in the air like an unfulfilled promise. Get rid of them without guns, said Locke. If you mean waiting for them to die out naturally, I'm not that patient. No, said Tettleman. We can be swifter than that. How? Tettleman gave the man a lazy look. They're my livelihood, he said, or part of it. You're asking me to help you make myself bankrupt. He not only looks like an old whore, Locke thought, he thinks like one. What's it worth, your wisdom, he asked. A cut of whatever you find on your land, Tettleman replied. Locke nodded. What have we got to lose, Cherick? You agree to cut him in? Cherick's consent was a shrug. All right, Locke said. Talk. They need medicines, Tettleman explained, because they're so susceptible to our diseases. A decent plague can wipe them out practically overnight. Locke thought about this, not looking at Tettleman. One fell swoop, Tettleman continued. They've got practically no defenses against certain bacteria. Never built up any resistance. The clap, smallpox, even measles. How, said Locke. Another silence. Down the steps of the veranda where civilization finished, the jungle was swelling to meet the sun. In the liquid heat, plants blossomed and rotted and blossomed again. I asked how, said Locke. Blankets, Tuttleman replied. Dead men's blankets. A little before the dawn of the night after Stump's recovery, Cherick woke suddenly, startled from his rest by bad dreams. Outside it was pitch dark, neither moon nor stars relieved the depths of the night. But his body clock, which his life as a mercenary had trained to impressive accuracy, told him that the first light was not far off, and he had no wish to lay his head down again and sleep, not with the old man waiting to be drunk. It wasn't just the raised palms, the blood glistening, that so distressed Cherick. It was the words he dreamt coming from the old man's toothless mouth, which had brought on the cold sweats now, that now encased his body. What were the words? He couldn't recall them now, but wanted to, wanted the sentiments dragged into wakefulness, where they could be dissected and dismissed as ridiculous. They wouldn't come, though. He lay on the stretched cot, the dark wrapping him up too tightly for him to move, and suddenly the bloody hands were there in front of him, suspended in the pitch. There was no face, no sky, no tribe, just hands. Dreaming, Tarek told himself, but he knew better. And now the voice. He was getting his wish. Here were the words he had dreamt spoken. Few of them made sense. Tarek lay like a newborn baby, listening to his parents talk, but unable to make any significance of their exchanges. He was ignorant, wasn't he? He tasted the sourness of his stupidity for the first time since childhood. The voice made him fearful of ambiguities he had ridden rough shod over, of whispers his shouting life had rendered inaudible. He fumbled for comprehension and was not entirely frustrated. The man was speaking of the world and of exile of the world, of being broken always by what one seeks to possess. Cherick struggled, wishing he could stop the voice and ask for explanation, but it was already faded, ushering Ushered away by the wild dress of parrots in the trees, raucous and gouty voices erupting suddenly on every side. Through the mesh of Cherick's mosquito net, he could see the sky flaring through the branches. He sat up, hands and voice had gone, and with them all but an irritating murmur of what he had almost understood. He had thrown off in sleep his single sheet. Now he looked down at his body with distaste. His back and buttocks and the underside of his thighs felt sore. Too much sweating on coarse sheets, he thought. Not for the first time in recent days, he remembered a small house in Bristol, which he had once known as a home. The noise of birds was filling his head. He hauled himself to the edge of the bed and pulled back the mosquito net. The crude weave of the net seemed to scour the palm of his hand as he gripped it. He disengaged his hold and cursed to himself. There was again today an itch of tenderness in his skin that he'd suffered since coming to the post. Even the soles of his feet, pressed on the floor by the weight of his body, seemed to suffer each knot and splinter. He wanted to be away from this place and badly. A warm trickle across his wrist caught his attention, and he was startled to see a rivulet of blood moving down his arm from his hand. There was a cut on the cushion of his thumb where the mosquito net had apparently nicked his flesh. It was bleeding, though not copiously. He sucked at the cut, feeling again that peculiar sensitivity to touch that only drink and that in abundance dulled. Spitting out blood, he began to dress. The clothes he put on were a scourge on his back. His sweat, sweat stiffened shirt rubbed against his shoulders and neck. He seemed to feel every thread chafing his nerve endings. The shirt might have been sackcloth, the way it abraded him. 
the next door, he heard Locke moving around. Gingerly finishing his dressing, Cherrick went through to join him. Locke was sitting at the table by the window. He was pouring over a map of Tettleman's and drinking a cup of the bitter coffee Dancy was so fond of brewing, which he drank with, drank with a dollop of condensed milk. The two men had little to say to each other. Since the incident in the village, all pretense of respect or friendship had disappeared. Locke now showed undisguised contempt for his sometime companion. The only fact that kept them together was the contract they and Stumpf had signed. Rather than breakfast on whiskey, which he knew Locke would take as a further sign of his decay, Cherrick poured himself a slug of Dancy's emetic and went out to look at the morning. He felt strange. There was something about this dawning day which made him profoundly uneasy. He knew the dangers of courting unfounded fears, and he tried to forbid them, but they were incontestable. Was it simply exhaustion that made him so painfully conscious of his many discomforts this morning? Why else did he feel the pressure of his stinking clothes so acutely? The rasp of his boot collar against the jutting bone of his ankle, the rhythmical chafing of his trousers against his inside leg as he walked, even the grazing air that eddied around his exposed face and arms. The world was pressing on him. At least that was his sensation, pressing as though it wanted him out. A large firefly whining towards him on iridescent wings collided with his arm. The pain of the collusion caused him to drop his mug. It didn't break, but rolled off the veranda and was lost in the undergrowth. Angered, Cherrick slapped the insect off, leaving a smear of blood on his tattooed forearm to mark the dragonfly's demise. He wiped it off. It welled up again in the same spot, full and dark. It wasn't the blood of the insect, as he realized, but his own. The dragonfly had cut him somehow, though he felt nothing. Irritated, he peered more closely at his punctured skin. The wound was not significant, but it was painful. From inside, he could hear Locke talking. He was loudly describing the inadequacy of his fellow adventurers to Tettleman. Stump's not fit for this kind of work, he was saying. And Cherrick, what about me? Cherrick stepped into the shabby interior, wiping a new flow of blood from his arm. Locke didn't even bother to look up him. You're paranoid, he said plainly. Paranoid and unreliable. Cherrick was in no mood for taking Locke's foul mouthing. Just because I killed some Indian brat, he said. The more he brushed blood from his bitten arm, the more the place stung. You didn't just have the balls to do it yourself. Locke didn't bother to look up at him from his perusal of the map. Cherrick moved across to the table. Are you listening to me? He demanded and added force to his question by slamming his fist down on the table. On impact, his hands simply burst open. Blood spurted out in every direction, splattering the map. Cherrick howled and reeled backwards from the table with blood pouring from a yawning split on the side of his hand. The bone showed. Through the din of pain in his head, he could hear a quiet voice. The words were inaudible, but he knew whose they were. I won't hear, he said, shaking his head like a dog with flea in his ear. He staggered back against the wall, but the briefest context was another agony. I won't hear, damn you. What the hell is he talking about? Dancy had appeared in the doorway, woken by the cry, still clenching the complete works of Shelley. Tettleman had said he could not sleep without. Locke readdressed the question to Cherrick, who was standing wild-eyed in the corner of the room, blood splitting from between his fingers as he attempted to staunch his wounded hand. What are you saying? He spoke to me, Cherrick said. The old man. What old man? Tettleman asked. He means at the village, Locke told him. Then to Cherrick, is that what you mean? He wants us out, exiles like them, like them. Cherrick's panic was ra rapidly rising out of anyone's control, least of all his own. The man's got heat stroke, Dancy said, you ever the diagnostician. Locke knew better. Your hand needs bandaging, he said, slowly approaching Cherrick. I heard him, Cherrick muttered. I believe you, just slow down, we can sort it out. No, the other man replied, it's pushing us out, everything we touch, everything we touch. He looked as though he was about to topple over and Locke reached for him. As his hands made contact with Cherrick's shoulders, the flesh beneath the shirt split and Locke's hands were instantly soaked in scarlet. He withdrew them appalled. Cherrick fell to his knees, which in their turn became new wounds. He stared down as his shirt and trousers darkened. What's happening to me? He wept. Dancy moved towards him. Let me help. No, don't touch me, Cherrick pleaded, but Dancy wasn't to be denied his nursing. It's all right, he said in his best, best side manner. It wasn't. Darcy's grip intended only to lift the man from his bleeding knees, open new cuts wherever he took hold. Dancy felt the blood spout between, beneath his hands, felt the flesh slip away from the bone. The sensation vested even his taste for agony. Like Locke, he forsook the lost man. He's rotting, he murmured. Cherrick's body had split now in a dozen or more places. He tried to stand, half staggering to his feet, only to collapse again, his flesh breaking open wherever he touched wall or chair or floor. There was no help for him. All the others could do was stand around like spectators in an execution, waiting the final throws. Even Stumpf had aroused himself from his bed and come through to see what the shouting was about. He stood leaning against the door lintel, his disease, thinned face, and disbelief. 
Another minute and Blood lost a feet of Cherik. He kneel, keeled over and sprawled face down across the floor. Dancy crossed over back to him and crouched on his haunches beside his head. Is he dead? Locke asked. Almost, Dancy replied. Rotted, said Tettleman, as though the word explained the atrocity they had just witnessed. He had a crucifix in his hand, large and crudely carved. It looked like Indian handiwork, Locke thought. The Messiah impaled on the tree was slow-eyed and decent and de indecently naked. He smiled despite nail and thorn. Nancy touched Cherik's body, letting the blood come with his touch and turned the man over, then leaned in towards Cherik's jittering face. The dying man's lips were moving, oh so slightly. What are you what are you saying? Dancy asked. He leaned closer still to catch the man's words. Cherik's mouth trailed bloody spittle, but no sound came. Locke stepped in, pushing Dancy aside. Flies were already flitting around Cherik's face. Locke thrust his bull-necked head into Cherik's view. You hear me, he said. The body grunted. You know me? Again, a grunt. You want to give me your share of the land? The grunt was lighter this time, almost a sigh. There's witnesses here, Locke said. Just say yes, they'll hear you. Just say yes. The body was trying its best. It opened its mouth a little wider. Dancy, said Locke. You hear what he said? Dancy could not disguise his horror at Locke's insistence, but nodded. You're a witness, if you must, said the Englishman. Deep in his body, Cherik felt the fishbone he'd first choked on in the village twist itself about one final time and extinguish him. Did he say yes, Dancy? Tettleman asked. Dancy felt the physical proximity of the group kneeling beside him. He didn't know what the dead man said, but what it did, what did it matter? Locke would have to land anyway, wouldn't he? He said yes. Locke stood up and went in search of a fresh cup of coffee. Without thinking, Dancy put his fingers on Cherik's lips to steal his empty gaze. Under the lightest of touches, the lids broke open and blood tainted the tears that had swelled where Cherik's sight had been. They had him buried him towards evening. The corpse, though it had slain through the noon heat in the coolest part of the store amongst the dried goods, had begun to putrefy by the time it was sewn up in canvas for the burial. The night following, Stump had come to Locke and offered him the last third of the territory to add to Cherik's share, and Locke, ever the realist, had accepted. The terms, which were punitive, had been worked out the next day. In the evening of that day, as Stumpf had hoped, the supply plane came in. Locke, bored with Tettleman's contemptuous looks, had also elected to fly back to Santorum, where to drink the jungle out of his system for a few days and return refreshed. He intended to buy up fresh supplies and, if possible, hire a reliable driver and gunman. The flight was noisy, cramped, and tedious. The two men exchanged no words for its full duration. Stumpf just kept eyes on the tracks of unfelt wilderness they passed over, though from one hour to the next, the scene scarcely changed. A panorama of sable green broken on occasion by a glint of water, perhaps a column of blue smoke rising here and there where land was being cleared, little else. At Santrum, they parted with a single handshake with let every nerve and stump's hand scorch and an open cut on the tender flesh between index finger. Santrum wasn't Rio. Locke mused as he made his way down to bar at the south end of town, run by a veteran of Vietnam who had a taste for ad hoc animal shows. It was one of Locke's few certain pleasures as one he never tired of, to watch a local woman, face dead as a cold maniac cake, submit to a dog or a donkey for a few grubby dollar bills. The women of Santrum were, on the whole, as unpalatable as the beer, but Locke had no eye for beauty in the opposite sex. It only mattered that their bodies be in reasonable working order and not diseased. He found the bar and settled down for an evening, exchanging dirt with the American. When he tired of that, sometime after midnight, he bought a bottle of whiskey and went out looking for a face to press his heat upon. The woman with a squint was about to accede to a particular peccadillo of locks, one of which she had resolutely refused until drunkenness persuaded her to abandon what little hope of dignity she had, when there came a rap in the door. Fuck, said Locke. See, said the woman. Fook, fook. It seemed to be the only word she knew in anything resembling English. Locke ignored her and crawled drunkenly to the edge of the stained mattress. Again, the rap on the door. Who is it? He said. Senor Locke? The voice from the hallway was that of a young boy. Yes, said Locke. His trousers had become lost in the tangle of sheets. Yes, what do you want? Message him, the man said. For gente, or gente. For me? He had found his trousers and was pulling them on. The woman, not all disgruntled by this desertion, watched him from the head of the bed, toying with an empty bottle. Butting up, Locke crossed from bed to door, a matter, matter of three steps. He unlocked it. The boy in the darkened hallway was of Indian extraction to judge by the blackness of his eyes and of that peculiar luster his skin owned. He was dressed in a t-shirt bearing the Coca-Cola motif. Miss at him, seeing poor Locke, he said again. Do hospital. The boy was staring past Locke at the woman on the bed. He grinned from ear to ear at her cavortings. Hospital, said Locke. Seem 
Hospital Sagrado Corcada de Maria. It could only be Stumpf walked up. Who else would know in the corner of this hell who'd call upon him? Nobody. He looked down at the leering child. Ven conmigo, the boy said. Ven conmigo. Go ahead, they. No, said Locke. I'm not coming. Not now. Do you understand? Later, later. The boy shrugged. Da morendo, he said. Dying, said Locke. Sin, da morendo. Well, let him. Understand me? You go back and tell him I won't come till I'm ready. Again, the boy shrugged. Emu dinero, he said, as Locke went up to close the door. You go to hell, Locke replied, and slammed it in the child's face. When, two hours, and one ungainly act of passionless sex later, Locke unlocked the door, he discovered that the child, by way of revenge, had defecated on the threshold. The hospital, Sagrado Coraca de Maria, was no place to fall ill. Better, thought Locke, as he made his way down the dingy corridors, to die in your own bed with your own sweat for company than come here. The stench of disinfectant could not entirely mask the odor of human pain. The walls were ingrained with it. It formed a breeze on the lamps. It slickened the unwashed doors. What had happened to Stump to bring him here? A barroom brawl? An argument with a pimp about the price of a woman? The German was just damn fool enough to get himself stuck in the gut over something petty. Senor Stump? He asked of a woman in white he accosted in the corridor. I'm looking for Senor Stump. The woman shook her head and pointed towards a harried looking man further down the corridor who was taking a moment to light a small cigar. He let go of the nurse's arm and approached the fellow. He was enveloped in a stinking cloud of smoke. I'm looking for Senor Stump, he said. The man looked at him quizzically. You are Locke, he asked. Yes. Ah, he drew on the cigar. The pungency of the expelled smoke would surely have brought on a relapse in the hardiest patient. I'm Dr. Edison Costa. The man said, offering his clammy hand to Locke. Your friend has been waiting for you to come all night. What's wrong with him? He's hurt his eye, Edson Costa replied, clearly indifferent to Stump's condition. And he has some minor abrasions on his hands and face, but won't let anyone go near him. He doctored himself. Why? Locke asked. The doctor looked flummoxed. He pays to go into a clean room. He pays plenty, so I put him in. You want to see him? Maybe take him away? Maybe, said Locke unenthusiastically. unenthusiastically. His head, said the doctor. He has delusions. Without offering further explanation, the man led off at a considerable rate, trailing tobacco smoke as he went. The route which wound out of the main building and across a small internal courtyard ended in a room with glass partition in the door. Here, said the doctor, your friend. You tell him, he said as a parting snipe. He pay more, tomorrow he leaves. Locke peered through the glass partition. The grubby white room was empty, but for a bed and a small table lit by the same dingy light that cursed every wretched inch of this establishment. Stumpf was not on the bed, but squatting on the floor in the corner of the room. His left eye was covered with a bulbous padding, held in place by a bandage ineptly wrapped around his head. Locke was looking at the man for a good time before Stumpf sensed that he was watched, being watched. He looked up slowly. His good eye, as if in compensation for the loss of his companion, seemed to have swelled to twice its natural size. It held enough fear in both it and its twin, indeed enough for a dozen eyes. Cautiously, like a man whose bones were so brittle he fears an injunctious breast will shatter them, Stumpf edged up the wall and crossed to the door. He did not open it, but addressed Locke through the glass. Why didn't you come, he said. I'm here. But sooner, said Stumpf. His face was raw, as if he'd been beaten. Sooner. I had business, Locke returned. What happened to you? It's true, Locke, the German said. Everything is true. What are you talking about? Kettleman told me, Cherik's babblings about being exiles. It's true. They mean to drive us out. We're not in the jungle now, Locke said. You've got nothing to be afraid of here. Oh, yes, said Stump, that wide eye wider than ever. Oh, yes, I saw him. Who? The elder from the village. He was here. Ridiculous. He was here, damn you, Stump replied. He was standing where you're standing, looking at me through the glass. You've been drinking too much. It happened to Cherik, and now it's happening to me. They're making it impossible to live. Locke snorted. I'm not having any problem, he said. They won't let you escape, Stump said. None of us will escape, or unless we make amends. You've got to vacate the room, Locke said, unwilling to countenance any more of this drivel. I've been told you've got to get out by morning. No, said Stump. I can't leave. I can't leave. There's nothing to fear. The dust, said the German. The dust in the air, it'll cut me up. I've got a speck in my eye, just a speck. And the next thing, my eye's bleeding as though it'll never stop. I can't hardly lie down. The sheet's like a bed of nails. The soles of my feet feel as they're going to split. You've got to help me. How, said Locke. Pay them for the room. Pay them so I can stay until you get a specialist from, San from 
Sao Luis, then go back to the village, Locke. Go back and tell them I don't want the land. Tell them I don't own it any longer. I'll go back, said Locke, but in my good time. You must go quickly, said Stumpf. Tell them to let me be. Suddenly, the expression on the partially masked face changed, and Stump looked past Locke at some spectacle down this corridor. From his mouth, slack with fear, came a small word. Please. Locke, mystified by the man's expression, turned. The corridor was empty, except for the fat moths that were besettling the, the bulb. There's nothing there, he said, turning back to the door of Stump's room. The wire mesh glass of the window bore the distinct imprint of two bloody palms. He's here, the German was saying, staring fixedly at the miracle of the bleeding glass. Locke didn't need to ask who. He raised his hand to touch the marks. The handprints, still wet, were on his side of the glass, not on Stump's. My God, he breathed. How could anyone have slipped behind him in the door and laid the prints there, sliding away again in the brief moment it had taken him to glance behind him? It defied reason. Again, he looked down the corridor. It was still bereft of visitors, just the bulb, swinging slightly as if to breeze the passage had caught it, and the moth swings, whispering. What's happening? Locke breathed. Stumpf, entranced by the handprints, touched his fingertips slightly to the glass. On contact, his fingers blossomed red trails which idled down the glass. He didn't remove his fingers, but stared through at Locke with despair in his eye. See, he said very quietly. What are you playing at? Locke said, his voice similarly hushed. This is some kind of trick. No. You haven't got Cherrick's disease. You can't have. You didn't touch them. We agreed, damn you, he said more heatedly. Cherrick touched them. We didn't. Stump looked back at Locke with something close to pity in his face. We were wrong, he said gently. His fingers, which he had now removed from the glass, continued to bleed, dribbling across the backs of his hands and down his arms. This isn't something you can beat into submission, Locke. It's out of our hands. He raised his bloody fingers, smiling at his own wordplay. See, he said. The German's sudden fatalistic calm frightened Locke. He reached for the handle of the door and jiggled it. The room was locked. The key was on the inside where Stump had paid for it to be. Keep out, Stump said. Keep away from me. His smile had vanished. Locke put his shoulder to the door. Keep out, I said, Stump shouted, his voice shrill. He backed away from the door as Locke took another lunge at it. Then seeing that the lock must soon give, he raised a cry of alarm. Locke took no notice, but continued to throw himself at the door. There came the sound of wood beginning to splinter. Somewhere nearby, Locke heard a woman's voice raised in response, response to Stump's calls. No matter, he'd have his hands on the German before help would come, and then, by Christ, he'd wipe every last vestige of a smile from the bastard's lips. He threw himself against the door, which increased fervor again and again. The door gave. In the antiseptic cocoon of his room, Stump felt the first blast of unclean air from the outside world. It was no more than a light breeze that invaded his makeshift sanctuary, but it bore upon its back the debris of the world. Soot and seeds, flakes of skin itched off a thousand scalps, fluff and sand, a twist of hair, the bright dust from the moth swing, Moats so small the human eye only glimpsed them in a shaft of white sunlight, each a tiny whirling speck, quite harmless to most living organisms. But this cloud was lethal to stump. In seconds, his big body, body became a field of tiny seeping wounds. He screeched and ran towards the door to slam it closed again, flinging himself in a hail of minute razors, each lacerating him. Pressing against the door to prevent Locke from entering, his wounded hands erupted. He was too late to keep Locke out anyhow. The man had pushed the door wide and was now stepping through, his every movement setting up further currents of air to cut Stumpf down. He snatched hold of the German's wrist. At his grip, the skin loosened as if beneath a knife. Behind him, a woman loosed a cry of horror. Locke, realizing that Stumpf was past recanting his laughter, let the man go. Adorned with cuts on every exposed part of his body and gaining more by the moment, Stumpf stumbled back, blind, and fell beside the bed. The killing air still sliced him as he sank down. With each agonized shudder, he woke new eddies and whirlpools to open him up. Ashen, Locke retreated from where the body lay and staggered out into the corridor. A gaggle of onlookers blocked it. They parted, however, at his approach, too intimidated by his bulk and by the wild look in his face to challenge him. He retraced his steps through the sickness-perfumed haze, crossing the small courtyard and returning into the main building. He briefly caught sight of Edson Costa, hurrying in pursuit, but did not linger for explanations. In the vestibule, which, despite the late hour, was busy with victims of one kind or another, his hairy gaze alighted on a small boy perched on his mother's lap. He had injured his belly, apparently. His shirt was just too large for him, was stained with blood, his face with tears. The mother did not look up as Locke mo moved through the throng. The child did, however. He raised his head, as knowing that Locke was about to pass by, and smiled radiantly. There was nobody knew, nobody Locke knew at Tettleman's store, and all the information he could bully from the hired hands, most of whom were drunk to the point of being unable to stand, was that their masters had gone off into the jungle the previous day. Locke chased the most sober of them and persuaded him with threats to accompany him back to the village as translator. He had no real idea of 
how he would make his peace with the tribe. He was only certain that he had to argue his innocence. After all, he would plead it hadn't been he who had fired the killing shot. There had been misunderstandings to be certain that he had not harmed the people in any way. How could they in all conscience conspire to hurt him? If they should require some penance of him, he was not above acceding to their demands. Indeed, might there not be some satisfaction in the act? He had seen so much suffering of late. He wanted to be cleansed of it. Anything they asked, within reason, he would comply with. Anything to avoid dying like the others. He'd even give back the land. It was a rough ride, and his morose companion complained often incoherently. Locke turned to deaf air. There was no time to loitering. Their noisy progress, the jeep engine complaining it now, every new acrobatic required of it, brought the jungle alive on every side, a repertoire of wails, whoops, and screeches. It was an urgent, hungry place, Locke thought, and for the first time since setting foot on the subcontinent, he loathed it with all his heart. There was no room here to make sense of events. The best that could be hoped was that one be allowed a niche to breathe a while between one swallowed flowering and the next. Half an hour before nightfall, exhausted by the journey, they came to the outskirts of the village. The place had been altered not at all in the meager days since he'd last been there, but the ring of huts was clearly deserted. The doors gaped, the communal fires always alight were ashes. There was neither child nor pig to turn an eye towards him as he moved toward, across the compound. When he reached the center of the ring, he stood still, looking about him for some clue as to what happened there. He found none, however. Fatigue made him foolhardy. Mustering his fractured strength, he shouted into the hush, Where are you? Two brilliant red macaws, finger-winged, winged, rose screeching from the trees on the far side of the village. A few moments after, a figure emerged from the thicket of balsa and jacaranda. It was not one of the tribe, but Dancy. He paused before stepping fully into sight, then recognizing Locke, a broad smile broke his face and he advanced into the compound. Behind him, the foliage shook as others made their way through. Tettleman was there, um, as were several Norwegians, led by a man called Bjornstrom, who Locke had encountered briefly at the trading post. His face beneath a shock of sun-bleached hair like, was like cooked lobster. My God, said Tettleman, what are you doing here? I might ask you the same question, Locke replied testily. Bjornstrom waved down the raised rifles of his three companions and strode forward, bearing a placatory smile. Mr. Locke, the Norwegian said, extending a leather gloved hand. Good we meet. Locke looked down at the same glove with disgust and Bjornstrom, flashing a self-admonishing look, pulled it off. The hand beneath was pristine. My apologies, he said. We've been working. At what? Locke asked, the acid in his stomach edging its way up into the back of his throat. Tettleman spat. Indians, he said. Where's the tribe? Locke said. Again, Tettleman. Bjornstrom claims he's got rights to this territory. The tribe, Locke insisted. Where are they? The Norwegian toyed with his glove. Did you buy them out or what? Locke asked. Not exactly, Bjornstrom replied. His English, like his profile, was impeccable. Bring him along, Dancy suggested with some enthusiasm. Let him see for himself. Bjornstrom nodded. Why not, he said. Don't touch anything, Mr. Locke, and tell your carrier to stay where he is. Dancing was already, had already about turned and was heading into the thicket. Now Bjornstrom did the straight, same, escorting Locke across the compound towards a corridor hacked through the heavy foliage. Locke could scarcely keep pace. His limbs were more reluctant with every step he took. The ground had been heavily trodden along this track. A litter of leaves and orchid blossoms had been smashed into the sodden soil. They had dug a pit in a small clearing no more than 100 yards from the compound. It was not deep, this pit, nor was it very large. The mingled smells of lime and petrol canceled out in the other scent. Tettleman, who had reached the clearing ahead of Locke, hung back from approaching the lip of the earthworks, but Dancy was not so fastidious. He rode around the far side of the pit and beckoned to Locke to view the contents. The tribe were putrefying already. They lay where they had been thrown, in a jumble of breast, buttocks, and faces and limbs, their bodies tinged here and there with purple and black. Flies built halter skelters in the air above them. In education, Dancy commented. Locke just looked on as Bjornstrom moved about the other side of the pit to join Dancy. All of them, Locke asked. The Norwegian nodded. One fell swoop, he said, pronouncing each word with unsettling precision. Blanket, said Tettleman, naming the murder weapon. But so quickly, Locke murmured. It's very efficient, said Dancy, and difficult to prove, even if any, anybody ever asks. Disease is natural. Bjornstrom observed. Yes, like the trees. Locke slowly shook his head, his eyes pricking. I hear good things of you, Bjornstrom said to him. Perhaps we can work together. Locke didn't even attempt to reply. Others of the Norwegian party had laid down their rifles and were now getting back to work, moving the few bodies still to be pitched amongst their fellows of the forlorn heat beside the pit. 
Locke could see a child amongst the tangle and an old man whom even now the burial party were picking up. The corpse looked jointless as they swung it over the edge of the hole. It tumbled down the shallow incline and came to rest face up, its arms flung either side of its head in a gesture of submission or expulsion. It was the elder, of course, whom Cherik had faced. His palms were still red. There was a neat bullet hole in his temple. Disease and hopelessness had not been entirely efficient, apparently. Locke watched while the next of the bodies was thrown into the mass grave and a third to follow that. Bjornstrom, lingering on the far side of the pit, was lighting a cigarette. He caught Locke's eyes. So it goes, he said. From behind, Locke, Tettleman spoke. We thought you wouldn't come back, he said, perhaps attempting to excuse his alliance with Bjornstrom. Stump is dead, said Locke. Well, even less to divide up, Tettleman said, approaching him and laying a hand on his shoulder. Locke didn't reply. He just stared down amongst the bodies, which were now being covered with lime, only slowly registering the warmth that was running down his body from the spot where Tettleman had touched him. Disgusted, the man had removed his hand and was staring at the growing blood stain on Locke's shirt. And that is how spoilers bleed. Sorry, I was having a hard time reading that one. It's really feel bad for the for the native people. Um, but I haven't read that one in a very, very, very long time. Um, and I'm and I'm personally working on like some decolonization stuff as I am. Uh, Mexican, and my I was raised very, very white. Uh, so it was different reading it again now that I have um, been reading a lot more about the awful things that have happened to native tribes. Um, I don't even know where they were. I guess I guess they were in Brazil. So the native tribes of Brazil, which they those are pretty much gone. There's there's a lot of fighting right now with deforestation. Um, so yeah, that was kind of a, a little bit of a difficult read. Okay, so uh next week we have Twilight of the Towers. I don't remember at all what this one is about. Like I have no memory what this one is remotely about this one's long. And then after that we have Last Illusion and then Postscript Book of Blood. And we will be done with all of our books of blood. Well thank you for reading with me and I will see y'all next week. For Twilight at the Towers. Let's see if I go back in this home. There it goes. I will see you next week.